Good morning. Good to have you all here for worship at Woodlawn, or I should say Living Hope Woodlawn Campus. Um, uh, especially our guests and visitors who are joining us today. Part of the service after the opening hymn will be the baptism of Caden Oftenberg. And I'm uh, glad for the guests who are here in connection with that. The order of service is printed out for you in your service folder, but you will need for the baptism portion a little insert. It will also be up on the screen as well. Um, this past Thursday was the Festival of Ascension, which we're observing today in our service. We're going to focus on the power of God, especially the power that works in us through the gospel because of what Jesus Christ has done and what, how Jesus' ascension plays into that. There is one correction when we get to page 5 in the worship folder. The wrong verses of the hymn are printed there in the, that song of praise. The correct ones will be up on the screen. Verse 1 is, is correct, but 2 and 3 are, we're supposed to be singing verses 4 and 5, not verses 2 and 3. So uh, when we come to that at, right after the baptism, take note of that. We'll be starting with our first hymn, Crowning with Many Crowns, right after we view this month's edition of The Wells Connection.
They also stressed that, with the strength and courage Christ provides by His Word, we can look at those changes not so much as challenges, but as opportunities. This is our Lutheran moment. But I think our world needs most right now having something like perfect video of some of the things that we've been best at this time. Seems to me that if you pay attention to open your ears and open your eyes, you see people raising questions and problems that the things that we don't believe is in terms of a perfect solution to. And so I want to know if you can see that uh, and be excited about the fact that we have what our world needs and what our world needs for us. Again, everybody, beginning with the insert, the gathering rite on holy baptism, 
We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. But we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. In obedience, in obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you have brought this child to be baptized. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Receive the sign of the cross both upon the forehead and upon the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. Caden Carter Offenberg, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our lives. Look with special favor on Caden and grant him a rich measure of your spirit that he may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized, so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our service now will continue with the song of praise once again up on the screen.
Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is the account of the Ascension. Luke actually gives it twice, both in his Gospel, which we'll read in a few moments, and also here at the beginning of the book of Acts. He's writing to a man named Theophilus, an unknown Christian man in, somewhere in God's kingdom. Um, he gives some details at the end of the Gospel and some details here. But in both of them, he talks about being witnesses, that we are to share that good news that a Savior has come ascended into heaven and is coming back one day. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. We sing together now Psalm 73.
the New Testament lesson, also the basis of our sermon today, from the, Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians, we read in chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. It is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense. And he will be my Savior. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's Gospel lesson from St. Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verse 44. He said to them, that's Jesus said to the disciples, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the, and from the, rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left, left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Please, at some point during this hymn or the rest of the service, take the time to sign the red friendship register you'll find along the center aisle of each pew. If you're worshipping with us, with us for the first time, we really appreciate it if you list some kind of contact information so we can thank you for your visit. We sing the hymn of the day, hymn 472, a hymn of glory, let us sing.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, God's word for our devotion is the epistle lesson we read a little while ago from Ephesians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when you hear or think about the word power, what kind of images come to mind? Maybe you think of man-made stuff, electric power plant, atomic, coal-fired, whatever, wind, solar. Maybe you think of, if you're a car person, it might be horsepower. How many horsepower in your car, Mike? 800, 800 horsepower in his race car, okay? Um, you might think of a uh, 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 rocket ship taken off, power to get objects out to the moon and beyond. Or maybe you think of nat power of nature, thunderstorm, lightning bolt, volcano, earthquake, hurricane, floods. Most of those we think of destructive kind of power, but that's power in there. Think of a lightning bolt. If we could harness that, how we could you know, deal with energy shortages that, that we may have. But all that power, all that energy, can't hold a candle to the incomparable power of the one of whom we say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in the words before us today, as we mark the ascension of our Lord Jesus, 40 days after his resurrection, he talks about that incomparable power that God has and how he uses it for us. That's what we want to focus on today. It's power displayed and symbolized in the ascension of, of Christ, his return to heaven. And it's also power displayed in our hearts, in the workings of our lives every day. Now, sometimes when we're talking about someone, describing them to somebody else, we might say, oh, Mary, she is, she's kindness personified. Or Jim is, is efficiency personified. And by that, what do we mean? We mean that that person displays in many different ways and, and in a lot of different occasions, putting those qualities or characteristics on display in their lives. Now, when it comes to when we think of power, the kind of power that rules and directs life here in this world and in the universe, we could be saying that God is power personified. Our God, again, in heaven, and especially God the Son, our, our risen and ascended Lord Jesus, in his return to his throne in heaven, it was all about power, the power he possesses and the power that he uses to affect every single thing that goes on in this world. Paul informs us of that here, talks about that here. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Now, you look at the life of Christ, and that power wasn't always on display. We talk about Jesus' humiliation. He set aside the full use of that power when he came into this world as an infant. And the people around him as he grew up, you know, they thought, well, there's the, you know, there's the little guy, you know, the, son, the son of a humble carpenter of Nazareth. And then he began his ministry traveled around kind of like an itinerant preacher. Now, once in a while, he let that power shine out in the miracles that he performed. <clears throat> but by and large, the, the crowds just recognize him. Oh, yeah, he's another traveling rabbi. And then we come especially to the last days of his life, life cut short by wicked men, beaten, nailed to that cross, dies. Would have been hard to see from that those outward appearances that incomparable power at work in Jesus. But then the last, the, the three days after his death, think of the power that was displayed. 
the early morning silence shattered by an earthquake, the gray dawn erased by the brilliance of a holy angel of God, the guards guarding the tomb bowled over like bowling pins, the stone, heavy stone rolled back, the tomb displayed as empty. Jesus had conquered death. The guilt and punishment for the sins of the whole world had been dealt with. Satan, muzzled forever in a sense, dealt permanently unseated from what he thought would have been his dictatorship over all of humanity. That resurrection of Christ, the greatest display of power the world had ever seen in a sense since the creation of the world. Now this power continues to be active in the works of God, just as real today, maybe not as flashy or as obvious. But listen to what Paul says. God seated him, Jesus, at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet. Now Paul's talking there about the ascension which we're observing today. And that ascension <clears throat> was a symbol of that power. It's wrapped up in the two pictures that Paul uses here. You know, like I said, in Apostles' Creed, we say Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Now, what does that mean? Well, who's all right-handed? Raise your right hand. Okay, just about lefties, go ahead. I'll let you raise your hand, too. There's some of you as well. I guess the ratio is about one out of every eight is a left-hander. But the right hand is normal. You know, we're stronger in the right, right arm. Well, in ancient kingdoms, that was pictured <clears throat> by whoever was sitting to the right of the one on the throne was in the position of authority. They would ascend into that position when that king or ruler would pass away. Well, when it talks about Jesus ascending to the right hand of God, now God doesn't literally have a right hand, but what it means is that Jesus now is back in his position of power and authority that he temporarily set aside uh, when he came into this world as a human being, as the God-man. And as such then, he is, well, he's the real guardian of the galaxy. He's the CEO above all CEOs. Nothing happens in this world without God's approval and the Son's approval on it. He guides and directs the affairs of this world. There's no earthly king or ruler, no devilish leader of hell who has more power than Jesus does. And he's able, well, to control the events of this life. Now, we may not always think he's doing the right thing or, or, or we wondered why he isn't taking care of all the, you know, the ghastly things we see going on in our world. Whether it's natural disasters or the, the evil plans and, and actions of the people around us. We wonder, why isn't Jesus acting? Why isn't he using that power? Well, we can't make that judgment on Christ. He's the ruler. It's by his decision. Now, he's going to have a final word. He's going to deal with evil come judgment day. And those who oppose him here and now, they will face that judgment. The other picture there is that it talks about uh, everything will be under his feet. And that, too, went back to ancient kingdoms that when a king or a, or a general was conquered, they were forced to lay face down on the ground, and then the winner would put his foot on the back of their neck. That person isn't going to do anything until that is released. The point is, Jesus has everything under his feet. It's under his dominion, his control. And nothing's going to happen without his knowing about it and allowing it to happen. Now this power, power personified in Christ, is not power for the sake of power, you know, brutality or selfishness. <coughs> Excuse me. This is power, Paul says, used on behalf of the church. God appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Excuse me. <coughs> so you see, the main benefactor today of that power of Christ is you and me, the church, the invisible church, the sum total of all, <coughs> of all who believe in Jesus as their Savior. 
Think of that picture he uses, that he's the head and we're the body. Well, without Christ, we're decapitated, you might say. We can't do anything that way. But Christ uses that power to grow and expand and guide and direct his body, the church. The fullness, him who fills all things, is directed towards us. And how does he do that? He sends the Holy Spirit. Maybe you remember from the confirmation days, the explanation, the third article. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. So Jesus is totally devoted, <clears throat> and the Godhead is totally devoted to our salvation. Jesus came to die for all humanity, paid for all their sins, but only those who believe in him will be saved. And it's by God's grace and honor for you and me that we've been brought into contact with that power and the Holy Spirit going to work in our hearts. You know, when we see a thunderstorm, you see one way off in the distance, you know, you can see the lightning, maybe you can't even hear the thunder. You don't think a whole lot about it. But at 3 a.m., when that lightning bolt hits next to your house and the windows rattle, then you think, and maybe you're a little bit scared. It's evident, that power. But it's not a deadly, the, the, the power of the gospel is not a deadly, frightening force for you and me. It's life-giving. It moves all of us <coughs> to believe that we've been saved by what Jesus did. It becomes real for us. We saw an example of that power today, right in front of our eyes. As the Holy Spirit went to work through that washing with water through the Word, miraculously, powerfully, creating faith in the heart of little Canaan. Now, for many of us, maybe that power has been at work all our lives from our baptism. Paul recognized that power. In his life for Paul, <coughs> it wasn't as an infant. He literally, literally was knocked off his horse by Jesus as he was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. And Jesus confronted him and said, Hey, Paul, you're fighting against me. That's got to stop. Now you're going to be my missionary to the Gentiles. And then Paul was baptized a few days later. Paul could talk to these Ephesians about the power of God working in their hearts and lives. He'd been their pastor for three years. It's about five years later when he writes this letter. He thinks about, he's heard reports about how the Holy Spirit had worked in their hearts. How they had been living their faith. And he prays and thanks God for that. Each of us here today has reason to thank and to praise God for that gift of faith which we have received, that we've been plugged into that power. It wasn't by our own efforts. None of us decided to believe in Jesus. We were all born spiritually dead, hostile to God's work in us. But in his infinite love, we can now see God's work in our hearts, bringing us to faith moving us to live in that faith. That's why we're here gathered around the Word, so we grow in that faith. Through Him, as we <coughs> go through life, we enjoy the peace and comfort of knowing that God's with us every day, guiding and directing the affairs of our lives, maybe in ways we don't always understand, but His promises in His Word that He's using that power for us, for the good of His people, and so now we're able to live the way God directs. Live in gratitude and joy, peace and comfort with praise on our lips and joy in our hearts. So let us indeed do that. And that's going to be called for <clears throat> for us who are members of Living Hope in big measure over the next weeks and months to demonstrate that power of God working through us as we begin working and worshiping <clears throat> together as a congregation. All the things that have to happen in the next two months, three months. It's going to take deal, a great deal of patience on the part of everybody. That we, you know, things may not always get done at the speed we would like it to or in the way we would like it to. We have to trust one another. We have to let that power of God work through us so that we can work together. So that that gospel message, that gospel ministry can continue to work in us and work in our community. 
Because that's the only way we can remain and grow in our faith, by staying in contact with that power source from God, the gospel, which brings about our salvation. And like I say, it's going to take effort on our parts. But that's because we're all thinking about a future. And Paul talks about that here when he calls it the hope to which we have been called. Our hopes and dreams are not pinned on building a, 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 a fine out, well, looking, fine looking congregation, but we want a congregation that's heavenward looking. A congregation that knows what its ministry is all about. It's about people's hearts and souls and plugging new people into that power source of Christ as well as growing in our own faith. Because we know that one day <clears throat> God's incomparable power is going to go to work on us raising us from the grave. <clears throat> giving us new, immortal, imperishable bodies that we can live with him forever in heaven. That's our final destiny. That's our reason for existence. That's what the body of Christ is to be about. Putting that power of God into action in our lives and touching more and more hearts with that power. So the next time, for example, next time you see a thunderstorm or a flash of lightning, you know, think of all the power and energy that that contains. But then think of that immeasurable power of God, the power that went to work through the work of Christ, the ministry of Christ to save the whole world, and then how it touched each one of us individually by his triumphant resurrection, his glorious ascension, his innocent, perfect suffering and death. That power has gone to work in you so that you now are a dearly loved child of God. So let us then reflect that power. Tap into it, use it, and share it with the people around us. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now by singing a hymn version of the creed, We All Believe in One True God, hymn 940. <laughs> Please stand as we present our offerings to the Lord. O Holy Spirit, impress us with the great urgency of preaching the gospel of our crucified and ascended Lord to every creature, and the importance of giving regular, generous gifts for this work. Teach us that we, that we do not lose what we give, but that our offerings are sound investments, helping to assure a blessed eternity to ourselves and others. Make our giving not only responsive to the needs of souls redeemed by Christ,
but responsive also to his great love for us. In his name we pray, amen. We also pray in connection with Christ's ascension. O Lord Jesus, exalted far above all principalities, power, might, and dominion, at whose name every knee should bow, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. O Lord Jesus, accept our praise and adoration. We know that our praise cannot exalt you any higher than the position you already have at the right hand of God. Yet we're bold enough to believe that you delight in our words of thanks and praise as your children. Accept our humble thanks for giving us the privilege of being part of your body, the church. For the many appearances you made after your resurrection, proving to witnesses that you had risen from the dead, we're grateful. We also thank you for assembling so many of the faithful to witness your ascension. These witnesses to your resurrection and ascension inspire us to follow you. As the ascended head of the church, O Lord, you're aware of the many problems confronting your people today in your church. We do not, do not ask that our work be made easier, but only for your power to help us cope with the situations we face. Help us to be your hands doing deeds of kindness. Help us to be your feet running errands of mercy. Help us to be your mouth witnessing to your love and the power of the gospel. And when at last we have fulfilled your purpose in our lives, take us to your ascension throne where we may share in your glory forevermore. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. We sing hymn 476 on Christ's ascension I now build. stand for our closing prayers. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn 929. May the peace of God. <coughs> Greetings again to all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. It was good to have had you have all here for our worship service today. Please excuse my al I'm fighting allergies this time of year, so please excuse my interruptions. Uh, be sure to pick up the green printed announcements on the table as you exit the sanctuary, the table where you pick up your service folders. Be sure to read through all of that. I'm going to highlight just a, a few things. First of all, in about a half an hour, Hopefully the voters' meeting will be held over at Good Shepherd, approximately 12 o'clock. Lunch is also going to be served, so you can get over there and pick up a, a cousin sub and some beverages for that. Um, the meeting will be getting after all the people have been served for that. So it's at the Good Shepherd Sanctuary on 100th Street, just north of Greenfield. 
This coming Thursday, six graduates from our Lamb of God School will be uh, recognized and honored. The graduation ceremony begins at 6.30 here in the sanctuary and uh, followed by a reception. All the members of the congregation are invited to that graduation ceremony. Um, out on the table to the left as you exit the sanctuary, you'll find some forms for, or first a, a sign-up sheet for Pastor Wessel's farewell uh, as we say goodbye to him and Lynn. On uh, June 4th, after the 1030 service, he'll be preaching in all the services that weekend, his farewell sermon. Um, there's a sign-up sheet there, or you can go uh, follow the sign-up link in, that's printed out in that green announcement uh, folder. <coughs> Excuse me. On that same table are forms for our updating our database as Living Hope. Uh, trying to combine those, we want to make sure we have all the latest information on, on all our members, uh, phone numbers, addresses, emails, things like that. So you can pick up a form, you can fill it out right away and put it in the box that's there, or you can bring it back, obviously, uh, next time. But we want to have that done by the end of June, so uh, don't delay too long. Also, there's a form there. We're putting together a Living Hope business directory. If you run a business and would like to be included in that, there's a form for that. You can put that in the same box um, <clears throat> as the database information. And finally, some updates on the, uh, the move that's going to be taking place. As I said in the sermon, the next two months are going to be frantic. But just face it, deal with each other, please, with patience and grace. Um, Jess, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Jess, no, don't put you on the spot. Okay, Jess Waller and the new principal are working together, put together a timeline. Lots of things that have to be included in that. Um, it's getting close to done, I guess, would you say, Jess? It's looking great, and I'm very proud. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, but we are going to need lots and lots of help over the next eight weeks, especially, to get furniture moved from... Good Shepherd over to here, ours in different classrooms and all of that stuff, where it's all going to be staged uh, while we paint and clean floors and things like that. We're not 100% sure, but they're working on it, so be patient. But you can sign up. Primary work will be done on Wednesdays from 1 until 8, yes. and there's shifts, so you don't have to work all seven hours, you know, but take a two or three hour shift. Um, at, you know, so we don't have 80 people at one time, but you know, we got 15, 6, 12, 10, 12, 16 people at a time. The sign up link is in your, that, that announcement sheet. There's also a separate sheet out on the table to, that has that uh, sign up link on it. A um, couple of Saturdays, Saturdays did I see in there too, Jess? At least one. Paint specific. Paint specific? Okay. So there are different opportunities. So please um, bear with us, but help us. And if you have questions, I'm going to send them. No, I'm not going to send them all to you, Jess. Okay. To Jess or to Dave Parbs, if you know who Dave is. Um, and the principals have some answers, but Jess has got most of the answers. So talk to Jess. With that, anything I missed, Jess, or anything I need to... Oh, oh, big thing for you folks here, 1030 service. Next week's 10 o'clock until we worship together on July 9th. We are, our plan is to begin joint worship on July 9th weekend. So Saturday, 5, Sunday, 8 and 10.30. But for the next six weeks, if you're worshiping here, it's 8 and 10 o'clock. A little bit confusing, but we, like I say, this, this is all fluid. So 10 o'clock next week, otherwise you're going to be late for church. With that, but July 9th weekend, we want you all over at Good Shepherd. We're worshiping in the gymnasium. Kind of like if you were here for Reformation, that'll be set up like that. Um, and there's other, other news I'm not going to get into now, but sign up to help, and we'll see you in church next week. <laughs>